Uh, next, we'll have our superintendent's uh, report. I've been looking forward to this one. Thank you, Chair Huntsman. I'm going to share two things today, just a brief report on the Student Advisory Council, and then they will be coming before you, I believe, in the January meeting to give a more complete report. They had a, a meeting recently, and you have two members of your board who serve on that committee or as advisory to the Advisory Council, and that would be Board Member Linda Hansen and Board Member Lisa Cummins. So they may have additional comments as well, but here you see the members of the council and the first meeting was great it was a long meeting I think it was at four hours I believe and uh, they really hung in there and these kids were so excited to serve they are really amped up and want to be of service to you and to have their voices heard and to give you um, advice and and counsel and uh, serve as the student liaisons to uh, connect you to the districts. So they are currently working with Jeff Van Holten, who serves as um, staff to the council. They are in, um, in conversation outside of meetings uh, using Slack, which is sort of an online meeting space. They are talking about things like standards and student safety and all of the things that, that you talk about, they're talking about as well and having great conversations. So when they um, come to meet before you, they, they may have some suggestions or just tell you what their <laughs> concerns are or what they've been talking about, but um, they, are, they are really invested in this process. So I just wanted you to know that they've had their inaug inaugural meeting and are working hard to be able to um, serve you better and meet with you in January. The next part of the report is, uh, ooh, what did I just do here? Um, reporting on my fall tour and you know this is a, a highlight other than board meetings every month I my other highlight is actually going and touring schools and um, start off by telling you that definitely a highlight for me of this particular tour was going back to my elementary school Anemone Elementary um, two-room schoolhouse that I attended has been torn down and rebuilt with the community center as well but it was really fun to go back and connect and see um, some kids in the school that are grandchildren of people I attended school with, but a lot of fun. Um, so here are the districts that I was able to visit in the charters as well. Emory, Grand, San Juan, Box Elder, Garfield, North and South Summit, Wasatch, Park City, Jordan, and then I had to um, postpone my Nebo visit, so I'll be doing that next Tuesday. And I was able to pop into Moab Charter School, Promontory School of Expeditionary Learning, Soldier Hollow, Charter School, and Weilandman um, School of Discovery. And I'll just briefly talk about my experiences with each of these. Um, in Emory School District, we had the opportunity to see all levels at Emory of uh, elementary, middle, and high school. And, um, you know, Emory's quite a vast district. And it, while it covers a lot of geography, um, it, it also covers a lot of history. And we were able to meet with uh, legislators who represent that area in the morning, as well as uh, district officials, and hear about some of the things that have changed over time that have created challenges for them. But what we observed were uh, educators who were so invested in supporting each and every student and family. And the students were really engaged. Um, there was a lot of community support. You know, the school is kind of the center of these little communities. And kids have a lot of opportunities. There was uh, really, in, they're working to increase technology and really focused on culture and climate. We saw a lot of work around anti-bullying efforts and um, just really individualizing experiences for kids in a real safe and positive environment. We heard a lot about the changing economy and how that's really impacting the schools and families and mobility and the ability to even recruit recruit and retain teachers. As we talked about equalization, this is a district that was on the downside of equalization, so they've lost a little bit of funding and really trying to think about if we're moving out of the space of using coal, what does that mean for us and for our economy? So a lot of conversations um, around how their economy has changed. Going to Grand was a grand experience. Um, I think one of the things I was so impressed with was their use of technology in appropriate ways as well as the art infusion that they have there. Uh, we talked earlier about the Beverly Taylor Sorensen um, board member slash Senator Reby talked about it earlier and um, I think they have one of the finest art specialists I've ever seen. The art was just amazing. We missed him that day because he had sixth graders out with him uh, doing plein air 
in, uh, I think it was at Dead Horse Point or somewhere. I don't know. They'd gone on a major field trip to do plein air painting, but really a, a lot of fun to see the artwork there. Um, I, pr you know, I have like 100 pictures for every district, and it just was too hard to choose. So um, they, they also have a wonderful tech center at Grand High School. Grand High School is celebrating 100 years this year. Uh, and it was fun to see all these old pictures that they had displayed everywhere and changing over time. But this tech center uh, that they have is really providing some additional pathways outside of recreation for children in Moab and thinking about how they can grow their economy beyond, um, beyond recreation. One of the things that I want to point out is a housing challenge. And we don't stop to think about when we're talking about recruitment and retention how uh, housing can make such a difference. So I'll give you a... a Case, case study, or a case in point rather, uh, in that they had a PE opening. Now, those of you who work in high schools know that PE openings come rarely. You know, PE teachers tend to stay around a long time. So they had a lot of applicants for a PE opening at their high school. Um, and they found three really good candidates. So they offered their top candidate a, the job, and he was so excited to take it, and spent two weeks trying to find housing and had to turn the job down because he, because he could not find affordable or available housing. Um, they In Moab, they rent out all their homes to Airbnb. They don't have a lot of full-time residents in many of their homes, and they won't rent out full-time to anyone, let alone a teacher. Um, if you can find a house, it's unaffordable. So they moved on to the second candidate. Same story, two weeks trying to find a home, couldn't find it. Third candidate couldn't find a home. So they had to find somebody who lives in the community with a recreation background and put them on an ARL. So that's the reality for, for many of these places, but in Grand particular in Moab, that was a, that's a really big challenge. And then even trying to find a mentoring for a lot of their inexperienced um, teachers. They also are struggling to um, work on collaboration among their agencies. And I know that Superintendent Stroder and their board are really committed to doing so. They have a lot of things going on in isolation. So that's one of the things that they're trying to um, move forward on. Um, the Moab Charter School is this really small, compacted school. And they um, really use their resources efficiently. Some of the things that they come up with, it was, it was fascinating to hear how um, they are able to engage in some experiences and find resources and funding in the community. And they are a school really focused. Their mission is focused on integration of art and science. And they work very closely, <clears throat> excuse me, with the park service and have rangers who come in and work right with the students. And then the students are um, able to go out and have experiential learning. Um, they're challenged by not having any space to grow. I mean, they really are on this little corner, um, and everything's just done in this little hub, and they use every inch of space. But they have um, students who want to come. They, I know they have a, a, a large list of students who want to come there. But uh, what I loved most was the collaboration between Grand S School District and Moab Charter. And they're at the table together, and they're working together. And I was, um, you know, I, I just loved seeing how they um, work and share, and we're so positive about each other. That was um, a, a bonus. Um, San Juan Dis School District was, I just have to say, it was sort of life-changing for me to spend two days trying to cover every inch of this huge, huge district. I'm so grateful to their superintendent, Ron Nelson, who th um, threw us in a, in a suburban with a cooler full of snacks and beverages and away we went and um, to be in this beautiful beautiful part of our state but to even more importantly to interact with these beautiful children and families was was really amazing they're so focused on um, honoring culture language and tradition the picture of the principal you see here they call her principal barbie and um, she has been so strategic about working with the tribal elders and they have a hogan at each of their schools and she talked about some of the things that they do inside of the Hogan that are um, both spiritual and academic in nature and, nature and trying to problem solve. And even something as simple as a snake coming onto the school grounds that has very deep cultural uh, significance and trying to mitigate that with thinking about safety and what to do with this snake um, and ended up being a tribal mitigation. And so a lot of really unique circumstances there, but there were tribal elders who were teaching students how to weave rugs and teaching them language and culture. And you can see in the schools that they um, use the Navajo language as well as English so that that language does not get lost. They have a lot of wraparound services that they're using to improve outcomes for students. And 
Um, I know when they when we were in Montezuma Creek talking about just building a small health center near the campus brought people into the community, and so it was growing their community and. Uh, it was increasing attendance at school and doing a lot of things for kids that they hadn't uh, thought of. And then great, great use of technology in San Juan. It's providing access for students that they wouldn't otherwise have um, for courses and individualized learning. I want you to pay attention to the young man um, on the right, in the bottom right in the suspenders. This young man, um, he created the artwork that you see in the center there, the pens, uh, it's, it's uh, ink work. And he carried around this case of these fine, fine point pens. I think he had a hundred of them in different colors. And uh, due to his artwork and academics, it, his his personal story is was such a challenge. He told me I could share it with you. Um, but he is a student who would be considered homeless because he just is sort of a couch surfer and grandma cares for him at times and friends and other family. Um, but this young man has about six full ride scholarship offers to, to different colleges and universities. And for many of these students who have these offers, they're sticking close to home at the community college in Arizona so that they can come back and forth and check on their family. Um, bottom left um, at Whitehorse High, I love uh, Principal Kim. She is working with some former students and trying to grow their own teachers. So the two young women you see there are becoming teachers and working as paraeducators and taking courses. Um, so they're really doing some amazing things to try and grow the community and the kids and uh, making sure that they stay connected to culture. Uh, a definite highlight was going out to Navajo Mountain. And um, you know, 30 kids in this school in the middle of nowhere. And uh, you, would, you would know when you were on a county road or a BLM road, <laughs> uh, that the road would change from uh, well-paved dirt. I mean, it just kind of kept evolving. But in this little school of 30 students, there's a husband and wife team who teach there. And the students are taking robotics and physics and uh, English language arts. And they, they really have the opportunity to engage in traditional things like welding. And there was a young man who, um, who showed me this project that he built in welding. I don't know how he's going to get it home. We might have to send you down there, Chair Huntsman, with your truck. Uh, but it, to, he said that you know, they don't, their addresses are so hard to find. And so a lot of the families try to use markers uh, where you can find their homes. And he built this huge uh, entryway out of metal to their homeland. And it, um, I think it had a bucking bronco or something on it that he had etched in metal. And it, he was just so excited that people would be able to better find their property when they came looking for it. Um, so this uh, great math teacher, I, I wish I could show you his printing. Maybe I can. Can you see that printing on the board? Not only was he an amazing math teacher, but his penmanship was <laughs> uh, far exceeded anything that I could do. Um, but I want you to just see the faces of these kids at Navajo Mountain. They're precious and beautiful and um, the things that they're able to engage in were just mesmerizing to me. Um, they have nurses and social workers who, who uh, rotate through their school. They're not there every day, of course, but they um, come through either once a week or every other week. And people are really um, devoted to these kids. And you can see the grad rates greatly improving in San Juan District at um, <coughs> Monument Valley and at Montezuma Creek and at Navajo Mountain. As I was leaving, I saw uh, one of the ladies kind of standing there whispering, and she's this lady that's been there for, I think, 30 years with the kids. And when I went back to her and kind of gave her a hug and said, what, what's on your mind? And she said, um, this is the first time that a state superintendent has ever visited our school, and you just told these kids how much they mean um, to the board. So it was a highlight. So these two little kiddos were my docents, and uh, they took me all through the school. They were awesome. And I asked them to speak to me in uh, Navajo and in English as they were taking me through the school. And I just think it's so important that, that we honor culture and language. And uh, they, they really, I saw some of the best instruction I've ever seen in San Juan District. And um, of course, they struggle with teacher recruitment and teacher and leader retention. It's, uh, you know, it's the, the lifestyle there is more isolated, but these kids are getting some great experiences. So we went from one end of the state to the other to Box Elder. And I think when we think of Box Elder, we often think of just Brigham City, and we don't stop to think that they have, they have remote and rural schools. We went to Snowville, another two-room schoolhouse. And uh, 
if you look at the bottom picture there, this is their school secretary. So she had an earpiece in and a headset. She's answering the phone and uh, tutoring first and second graders while she's <laughs> taking care of the school. She was awesome. And uh, they just have found so many clever ways to, to utilize the adults in the community and work with these kids who are doing really well. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen better attention to culture than um, I saw at um, the junior high that we visited and at Box Elder High School. And the kids were just amazing. While we were there, we had the opportunity to hear the entire junior high um, student body come to the commons area and um, uh, sing, sing the Star Spangled Banner and to recite the pledge. And they're very patriotic and very civic-minded at the school. And I love their uh, motto of WIN. You see it everywhere throughout the school, and it stands for what I need. And they've created schedules around individualization and all sorts of ways to um, provide support for the kids and really um, rich in, in arts. Um, well, I was able to visit uh, an amazing charter school, Promontory School of Expeditionary Learning, where, again, their focus is outdoor education and arts integration. And they have a large piece of land that they're, you can see the plans on their wall for what they're trying to do, but they... Um, really are very thoughtful about the outdoor landscape and providing a lot of ways for kids to get out and learn in nature. They're, um, they don't call them pods or grade levels, but they're student crews. And um, just I, I love that thought that we're a crew learning together. And the kids were really driving the learning. They were um, very much focused on collaboration and learning together. And um, the, you know, it's really, they take that expeditionary part very seriously of the school mission with discovery and collaboration. And, um, you know, when I walk into a school, I think what I want to send my kids there, my grandkids, my neighbors, my nieces, nephews, and um, I just wanted to stay there and work. It was an awesome school. So back to my homeland of Garfield School District. Um, I hadn't been to Anamone since my uncle died a few years back. And since I, my family left in 1968, I don't know that I've been there uh, many times. But um, some things haven't changed, and then some things have vastly changed. And to see the use of technology, if you, th you think about the landscape, again, of, of Garfield District, I mean, it's, it's vast, and most of the landscape is taken up by the federal government. And so they have all of these agencies that they need to work with and, and challenges, but they're doing some really creative things with technology. So they're piloting um, a way to have Wi-Fi on buses with the Wi-Fi embedded in the device so that they're not... Uh, beholden to cell towers, etc. Because what's happening now for a lot of the remote and rural students, they get on a bus, they're going to a game. For some of these kids, it's an hour, you know, to, to go from school to home. And um, I know my older siblings experienced that winding through a canyon through the winter. And they um, get to a school, and if there is Wi-Fi at the school, sometimes they can log in. But this is a way that they're piloting and trying to think about how can they actually have it built into the device so that they can do their homework on the bus and, of course, with all of the appropriate security built in. And uh, a lot of opportunities for kids. So when you think about these remote and rural schools and they're multi-age and you've got, you know, one teacher K-6 or two teachers K-6 and a couple of pair, ed couple of pair educators, um, they're doing some amazing things. The day that we were there, um, they had teacher development uh, the first day. And it was fun to get in and hear the conversations and hear what teachers are struggling with and what they're working on. And um, Allison Riddle, for those of you who know Allison, she was actually there doing some math work um, with the teachers when, when we were in Panguitch. They also have some really interesting building needs of so the way that buildings were built back in the day. <laughs> and trying to think about how do you upgrade those with safety features. So that was something that was really interesting um, to observe. Um, in South Summit School District, they are really STEM focused and, and so student centered. And when we talk about personalized learning, sometimes we just jump right to technology. But I would like to broaden that and say they are really trying to personalize it for students and families. So they have a lot of opportunities for, um, for families to engage in education in blended ways. Um, they also are challenged by the growth and affordable housing. And when you see the spread up over hills and trying to figure out where districts begin and end, um, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the most unique features that the district has put forward is the Silver Summit Academy. And it's a blended learning environment. And they have students from South Summit, from Park City, uh, from North Summit, from Wasatch, that either attend part-time face-to-face, online, fully attend there, 
and it's a, a K-12 environment. And it was really fun to interview the students and see how it's making a difference for the students. So some students, for example, could go to their homeschool halftime and come to this center or take online classes at the center. Um, it's pretty new, uh, so it's kind of in these growing pains, but I was really impressed with what they're able to offer. We went around the hill, over the hill, around the hill to Colville. Um, and, you know, there's, even though they're so closely yoked and have similarities, there were also vast differences. Colville felt very much more to me like Anemone in a way. You know, I mean, it was like this little um, hamlet, but kids are getting great, great opportunities for learning. One of the things of note is I put this sassy teacher folding her arms um, on there because uh, they're, the classrooms at the high school that were the antithesis of what you often see, where you walk in and you just kind of see some stark classrooms and a few posters on the wall and a few other things. These teachers were so intentional about the climates that they were creating in their classroom, in part based on the way that they designed their classroom. And they all had a very home-like feel to them, and, um, and it's the way they treated the students as well. It's sort of like one big family, and it was um, a really fun place to visit. What I loved about their use of technology is that they weren't using the technology as a crutch and a default, but they were really using it as a, a, a tool and blending that with other ways of instructing. The, ki the kids were really used to a collaborative environment and a lot of mixing of small groups and um, varying flexible groups so that kids were getting the kind of interventions and support that they needed. Then on to beautiful uh, Wasatch School District. It's a school district just rich in and uh, tradition and history, but it's, I think it's one of our most innovative districts out there and really doing some amazing work. Um, it, the, you might notice if you see that bright, spunky gal in a gold sweater on the far right, that is Miss Drew Camp's classroom. She was our, you might remember, Drew was our intern. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so fun to see her as a brand new teacher and the kind of support that she's getting at Wasatch. And her students uh, love her. That was really apparent. And to be able to interview them and spend time with them in her English classroom was fun. Um, I want to point out um, a few things. You'll notice that uh, they are dealing with a virtual reality. And uh, were, you, were you looking at lungs, heart? I was looking at the brain. The brain. So um, it, one of the fun things that we got to see is their Wasatch CAP Center. And this center is uh, a tech center, basically, but it's really focused on students working with industry. So they have mentors come in right from industry and help these kids with real world problem solving and real projects. So kids that were in the engineering were solving problems for an engineering company uh, in, in the Wasatch area. Um, and this gentleman behind board member Ellis is um, retired now, a neurologist who was head of the neurology department up at the U of U uh, neurology, uh, neurology department at the U of U uh, Med Center. And he comes and kind of volunteers basically every day. Uh, they have this virtual cadaver. It was, it was really hard to get a picture of it. Uh, but Hal, the virtual cadaver, um, you act, uh, yeah, you can actually take your finger and run it down Hal and split him in half and flip him over and see all the body parts. And Hal was a real person that donated his uh, body to science to be able to dice it all up and take all of these shots of it digitally so that the kids have this. I mean, think about learning anatomy that way. Um, it's just, yeah. Yeah, just teeny tiny slices. I mean, it was truly amazing. And there are three of those machines in the state, one at the University of Utah, one at Weber State, and one right there at Wasatch School District. I mean, that's just amazing. So um, we just got to see so many amazing things, ROTC and their TV broadcasting. And again, they're challenged by population growth and funding to keep up with the growth, growth and uh, closing achievement gaps. But I want to point out that they are really, really, really literate, really, really, really they are literacy focused, K-12. And it's not just something you see K-3, but all throughout, um, all throughout their district. We did a pop-in over at Soldier Hall. This was not um, scheduled, but their, their sweet principal said, come on by. And they've taken this um, barn that was um, donated to them basically, or um, sold to them at a minimal cost. And it was, um, it was a huge space, but beautiful. And the way that they took this shell and made it into a thriving, school community was quite amazing. They moved, so they were on one side of the valley and moved uh, to a space where it would create 20 more minutes for parents to drive their kids there, but the parents were really committed um, to this school. And 
um, they just really use their resources efficiently. I, I've never seen um, staff members, especially their custodian, some of the stuff he was picking up for a song. I, he, he is an expert shopper, that's all I can say. So um, really a great experience there. Park City, you see the same kind of thing with uh, in, that we saw in San Juan with culture and art and language infusion. Um, up in the upper right hand, that is a cohort of kids who's been in a coding cohort for four years. They're now fifth graders. And these uh, students, we got to observe them engaged in coding, and they really are doing some amazing work. Um, again, use of technology everywhere, providing equitable opportunities. These young men in the far right, as I interviewed them, they talked about um, that, well, actually their principal told me that they get on the bus and they'll ride the bus around for an hour after school um, just to use the Wi-Fi on the buses. And so these, these kids were so connected uh, to trying to do well that even on their lunch period, they all sat with their Macs, and if you saw their screens, you would see that they were engaged in homework, not social media. And um, to think that they didn't have these connections in their home, so they would ride a city bus around for an hour uh, in order to use the Wi-Fi. So it tells you the equity needs that we have. Um, and Park City's been really uh, upfront about cha tackling their challenges of mental health and having high expectations for all. We met a, a bright new principal at Park City High that was really um, – really forward thinking. So I'm excited to see what happens there. Um, and then also we got to visit the Weilandman School of Discovery. And uh, while we were there, we got to see Cindy Phillips, who many of you know is the charter board member, a uh, state charter board member, and she was teaching Latin. And it was fun to see her in action, uh, and her students were doing really well. Um, the parents are really involved there. They're really committed to the mission, and their emphasis is on the classics and art and music and literature. And Board Member Lear, I don't know if you want to add anything about Park City or Weilandman. Just that I, I think the, the Weilandman School is an example of a really good charter school doing a lot of very innovative things and um, in, in a very efficient way. And, and the Park City district experience was just as, uh, and I've been there that periodically, I wish I'd was there more often, but I was amazed at, and to some extent, it is it demonstrates what you can do with money, um, and a community who's absolutely committed to to putting money and has the ability to put money into the school system and the and the um, ideas they have. But it was just I was just stunned by the. Um, innovation, the community projects, yeah. and their openness. I mean, it was a really um, inspiring uh, um, opportunity to see the school district's openness to, to try new things. And, and it's sort of become a cliche, but this was the program in action. And I just have to say thank you so much to Superintendent Dixon, who invited me and made me part of the discussion and, and helped me um, meet some of the uh, school district administrators. A few of them I knew, but I it was just it's just such a wonderful experience yeah. to do that. And Thank you. If I may, uh, Vice Chair Ellis, do you want to say anything about what's that? Um, I'm not on. You, there. there you go. It was fun to go through Wasatch. I. Um, Luckily, not 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 luckily. This is a one of the English teachers that we were scheduled to see was ill, so that wasn't lucky. But we were lucky because then I got to go into a classroom of one of my neighbors who is just an excellent teacher. So that was fun opportunity. Um, but I have always enjoyed seeing what they're doing with the CAPS program. I think it's a great um, partnership that they have with the community um, to give these kids dish different opportunities. And I did want to mention something about South and North Summit because I. Just wanted to publicly say I was sad to miss it. I had a grandbaby the day before, and so I canceled so that I could just be at the hospital. But anyways, I'm going to have to go to that tour on my own because I, it looks like they've done some great things there, yeah. too. Thank you. And I, I loved having board members with me, so thank you so much. Um, just last but not least, um, I did go out to Jordan School District at the invite of going to see um, some learning communities in action at Mount Terman Middle School. Fort Harriman Middle School, um, and it, it was um, a phenomenal experience. So while we were there, 
um, I was able to go to their tech center and then tour, really look at all of their building and tour Jordan District and see the challenges and issues that they face with growth and with building. And that, that was something to behold as well. Um, but to see their learning community in action where they were really focused on the right things and they have protocols in place, but they spend some of their morning on intervention. So every, every teacher is there uh, and as a group, they're focused on individual students by name, by intervention. And to hear their ideas where somebody would say, this student isn't doing anything in my class and another teacher say, well, send that project with Johnny to my class because I'm working on this and I can have him work on that and I can mentor him while he's in my class. I mean, they were just thinking of everything that they could do on behalf of kids. Um, and uh, then the tech center to see what they were doing with science and health sciences and engineering was great fun. At the bottom, this is a, uh, the director there allowing himself to be poked. I think they gave him 11 different pokes while I was there, while they were practicing different uh, needles. So. He was a good sport to do that. Yeah. So if you uh, if you are ever if you find yourself out in uh, Harriman and Daybreak and um, all of those places out there, Bluffdale, drive by and see the schools that are being built, and you see the challenges that they're facing with growth. It's just astronomical. So it was fun to drive around with the their superintendent in charge of building. Um, so overall, just four things that popped out for me. I was looking for school safety issues uh, in every building that I went in. We talked about school safety, and there's some great ways that they're using digital resources to check people in, allow people into the school, and there's a lot going on with school safety all over the state. Um, the rural and remote schools and, and districts are using some of the most innovative practices in the state. They're, they're just doing incredible work, and their kids are uh, the beneficiaries of some good outcomes. The digital teaching and learning initiatives that are happening around the state, they really are making a difference. It's not just bright, shiny things, but they're using them really appropriately as tools for learning. And uh, we can't let go of, we can't let uh, go of this, with, we can't lose sight of the housing issue that we have for teachers as an issue of recruitment and retention. We haven't talked about it much. We talk about wages and conditions, and we don't talk much about some of these ancillary issues like housing. In San Juan, they have teacher housing right on the school. So if you're a teacher in Monument Valley, you live at the school, basically. You really live at the school. It's not just metaphorical. Um, so we have to have those conversations, I think, with policymakers and think about um, what we might do to mitigate that issue for staff if we want quali qualified teachers in our schools. So thank you to the board for supporting me in doing these tours. I do believe it makes a world of difference. They know that you care about them by being there. Uh, and they know that there are now concrete examples that we can bring back when you put a policy in place or a, a rule um, that we have evidence of how it works or doesn't. So I know it's time away from the office, but I think it's time well spent, and I really appreciate your support in doing this. So you'll have to keep me around for at least another year because I've got 10 more to go <laughs> next year. No, thank you. Um, I also want to thank the superintendent. It, she calls it a listening tour, and when I hear back from superintendents and Lo the local board members um, on the visit, it's exactly what it is. It's all about listening and observing and not lecturing and telling. Um, and it's, it's really appreciated. They have a little connection with um, San Juan and the Navajo Nation, and they really, really appreciate, well, they appreciated the visit, but they also appreciate the support that USBE provides for um, the education challenges uh, that they have, and they're getting results. Uh, the, the numbers are improving, and it, any time that we question any of that, they would be more than glad to come and address our board uh, again uh, and share their appreciation. So we, we have a diverse state. Of course, you know, we hear about the diversity of our board a lot, but uh, the education challenges are real, and we're just very fortunate that we have really our education community outside of us, including board members, the other board, local board members are addressing as aggressively as they can at uh, dealing with the issues and making education happen. So I appreciate the superintendent um, getting out there because it, it is a big state, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so with that, we're, we're going to take a quick break. Um, we'll, try to, we'll try to get back in here about seven after. Um, 
by 10 after we have to be taking care of business. So let's take a quick break. <laughs> 